Part 3. Making a Kingdom. 3000 to 2650 BC. 16. The Sarik Tomb. The story of the Nakata Mastaba, circa 3000 BC. Driving north from Thebes to Dendera on the West Bank Road through the narrow desert that lies between the cultivation and the cliffs, it is easy to pass the sprawl of celebrated cemeteries known by the collective name of Nakata without noticing them at all. In a low light, though, in the early morning or at sunset, the shadows of Petrie's excavation stand out across the little desert. Stop, then, and walk through the empty graveyards, and it is as if his excavation finished. Yesterday, the gravel mounds raised by Petrie's workmen as they dug the grave. Pits are still scattered with slivers of white bone, and lying all around are shirts. Of the fine pottery that first drew Petrie to the site. In the winter of 1895, as Petrie dug those cemeteries, he knew neither the age, nor the identity of the people he was excavating in knowledge of Egypt in the age before the pharaohs was virtually non-existent, fortified by the discovery of some inscriptions on the granite dories of a nearby pharaonic temple that had been dedicated to Seth, a god of foreignness and of confusion, Petrie at first thought that he had uncovered the unlettered relics of a previously unknown foreign tribe, a new race, as he called it, that had emigrated to the land of Pharaoh. The French prehistorian Jacques de Morgan, however, the director of the government service des Antiquités, believed the graves to be prehistoric. And two years after Petrie had finished his excavation, he visited the Nakata. Cemeteries as part of a general survey of prehistoric sites within the Nile Valley, and proved by further excavation that their inhabitants had lived before the age of kings. Walking just a few miles south of Petrie cemeteries, De Morgan had first noticed a pattern of low rectangles among the sand dunes, and decided to investigate. Then, as his workmen dug into the enormous, custard yellow drifts, he found that they were covering great smears of dun dark, dirty mud brick dust, the remains of some enormous and utterly enigmatic buildings. Unfortunately, though he had counted the outlines of at least three separate structures on the surface, only one of them still contained the identifiable remnants of a solid building, the lower sections of a massive mud brick rectangle some thirty yards wide and almost twice as long, with walls some nine feet thick that had been built straight onto the surface of the desert plain. A strange, slope-sided structure such as no archaeologist had ever seen, with 21 internal chambers and no connecting dories, the building that owed its preservation to an enormous fire which, as the Morgan found some intrusive burials of the second millennium BC, unburnt and interred, set into the Ashevit's destruction must have taken place quite early in Pharaonic history, though the great blaze had partly fired the sun-dried building bricks and thus preserved them, at the same time it had burnt so long and so intensely inside the kiln-like structure that most of its original contents had been reduced to ash and clinker. Most of the pottery was distorted and some had been reduced to slag. Porphyry had cracked and vitrified, limestone calcined and granite granulated, while pallets of fine, hard siltstone from the wadi hammamad had split, melted, and bubbled in the heat. Apart from a single rune that the Morgan found still stacked with sealed storage jars, only tiny fragments of the original contents remained, glistening in the soft ash of the building's burnt-out chambers. These, though, comprised a unique collection of small objects, a shoal of little fishes, like English 18th-century gambling tokens, made of slivers of fine ivory, some tiny flasks most beautifully cut from black obsidian, a glass-like. Volcanic stone imported from the Yemen or Ethiopia, and polished as highly as the little fish. There were, as well, three sets of small, exquisite sculptures, some model lions and hunting dogs of ivory and several three-inch sphinxes cut from rock crystal, which bear comparison with similar pieces that have since been found in other near-contemporary tombs, where they appear to have been pieces of board games that were buried with the dead. Quantities of ivory labels were also scattered through the building, one of them hinting of considerable amounts of jewelry, of which de Morgan would recover but a single golden bead. 
decorated furniture had once been stored. Within its dark brick magazines, as well, along with the remains of numerous bone and lays, there were some exquisitely modeled ivories in the shape of bulls. Legs that, when tied to wooden frames, were a traditional motif for the legs of beds and chairs. Mixed in with all those tiny treasures, De Morgan found a mass of traditional and aquat and grave accoutrements such as Petrie had recovered from. The nearby cemeteries, Nakwad and pottery and vases, some gloriously flamboyant. Flint slaughtering knives, a few Red Sea shells and fish bones, gazelle horns, faience bracelets and ivory hairpins. From the outset of his excavation, de Morgan had seen that this great brick magazine with its ruined stores and single central chamber had housed a burial. And yet, despite a plethora of elegant if enigmatic hieroglyphs engraved on, ivory and stone and impressed on dozens of clay jar ceilings, he could find no indication of the name of the person for whom the tomb was built. The following year, however, Ludwig Burchard, the founder of the German Archaeological Institute at Cairo, returned to Nakata to reserve de Morgan's excavation. An architectural specialist engaged in excavating pyramids. Burchard had been intrigued by the discovery of prehistoric Egyptian Architecture and exasperated by the perfunctory nature of de Morgan's repertoire upon the excavation, which he had entitled the Tombeau Royal de Negada. So, Burchard reopened the tomb, made detailed plans of its complex brickwork and, in a subsequent analysis of its numerical subtleties, established that the tombs. Designers had employed the standard pharaonic measuring unit of a cubit, which, at around 1 foot 8.61 inches, is usually described as the length of the human forearm. Noticing that de Morgan had found a broken picture plaque within the tomb, which held a drawing of a Sarik-like building containing an image similar to that of a hieroglyph with the phonetic value men, Burkhardt published his observations on the tomb as Das Grab de Menes, dash the tomb, that is, of the legendary Menes. In its time this identification generated a great deal of heat in archaeological journals, but it has since been discarded with the re-examination of seal impressions from the tomb which contained the names of King Aha, Narmer's successor, and a queen, Nithotep. More important than these archaeological shenanigans, part of the rivalries between European archaeologists and Egypt which, in the 1890s, were very fierce, was the fact that de Morgan had realized that the contents of the great tomb were directly related to those of the tombs which Petrie had excavated in the nearby prehistoric cemeteries. And just two years later, Petrie, after inspecting the finds from de Morgan's great brick tomb in the storerooms of the Cairo Museum, had seen the same connections, observing that they were of a slightly later period than the majority of objects he had found within the nearby cemeteries. De Morgan then, had found a missing link between prehistory and the pharaohs which, along with the discovery in that same winter season of the Great Cache at Hierakompolis, had convinced the usually intransigent Petrie that he had been mistaken and that the cemeteries he had been excavating for several years were in fact pre-dynastic, as he now termed them. Indeed, it was during that same year, in the summer of 1899, that Petrie completed the refinement of his sequence dating system that still forms the basis of modern descriptions of the last thousand years of Egyptian prehistory, a sequence that he could now attach to the beginning of the classical histories of the Egyptian pharaohs, Uruk in Egypt, just as remarkable as the calcined contents of the great burnt tomb of Nakata, was the fact that, as Burchard realized, the building of itself, its size, its proportions and precisions, represented the beginning of ancient Egyptian monumental architecture. Standing, when it was freshly built, at an estimated height of some 30 feet, it was an entirely unexpected debut, since all four of its gently battered walls had been enlivened by a complex and distinctive design, a pattern composed of series of stepped verticals that between them created sequences of niches. When the 60-yard-long tomb had stood to its full height, these would have produced a regular repeating pattern of sun and shadow lines, making it stand out dramatically in the desert's flattening glare. Though the upper sections of the tomb had entirely disappeared, the plan of
These elaborate brick niches showed that their original appearance had been the same as the drawing of the Sarik hieroglyph, the sign that showed a royal compound and had denominated and enclosed the names of the first pharaohs. Consequently, the full-size architectural version of the striped walls that the Morgan found at Nakata is now known as a palace facade, more recent. Excavations having shown that the structure shared its distinctive patterning with many other near-contemporary brick-built monuments, most obviously, perhaps, the line of gray tombs that stand on the horizon at Saqqara. Later, too, the same pattern would become a staple element of pharaonic culture and was widely used in various forms in temples and in tombs, where it enlivens everything from the Shrines of gods in the sarcophagi of pharaohs to humble coffins and domestic furniture. Like much of later Nakwad in design, this highly distinctive pattern was a local adaption of an Uruk design, specifically, the palace facade which had long been a characteristic architectural ingredient of temples built in the Jizira and the Levant, in which, like the great tombs of Nakata and Saqqara, had also served as storerooms for produce and for precious goods. Though engravings on Uruk seals made centuries before the building of these, mud brick tombs hold clear images of Mesopotamian temples with Sarik like patternings. It seems unlikely that such tiny images alone would have prompted the introduction of full blown decorative mud brick architecture into the valley of the Nile. It is more likely that the sudden appearance of this powerful and idiosyncratic design was a consequence of the so called second wave of Uruk. Expansion. This, so recent archaeological analyzes suggest, was taking place in the centuries before King Narmer, when impressive buildings with similar lineage facades were being built in settlements in Anatolia and Syria, in which, as the presence of some Nakwadan pottery and other Nilotic goods that have been found within them would suggest, were in contact with the Nakwadan trafficking networks. Nor were these later Uruk settlements temporary or slight affairs. Abuba. Kabira, for example, a Syrian site on the banks of the Euphrates some 600 miles upstream of the city of Uruk, had a population of six to 8,000 people. Though large, it was only one of dozens of such colonies. Like the Nakwadan trading networks, these settlements had made extensive use of traditional cylinder seals on the mud stoppers of jars, for sealing doors and on the ties of leather bags. And tokens too, those basic elements of Mesopotamian accounting, are not uncommon in these same settlements. From such locations, therefore, wool and other products of the later Neolithic Revolution such as cheese and oils, may have been trafficked, in stone, wood and metal sent back to the mother. Cities on the silty Mesopotamian plains which, like the Nile Delta, were largely lacking such commodities. Standing like many a contemporary Egyptian site, on a low desert terrace by a river, the colony at Abu Kabira was enclosed within substantial, elaborately, niche walls that ran on for a mile and more. At least one splendid temple stood within the town and that, too, sported similarly niched interior walls. Six miles to the north, at Jebel Aruda, an old indigenous settlement had a similar structure with a near-identical niche facade built at its center that imitated similar Uruk. Originals and also had an elaborate series of thick-walled rooms in its interior, similar to those the Morgan had excavated in the tomb at Nakata. Traveling. Nakwadans, therefore, would have seen impressive architectural examples of the Sarik pattern at many sites like these. Engravings on an elephant's tusk found in the great Kasha Hierakompolis, indeed show just such a prospect, carefully. Drawn images of a series of palace facades with rows of accompanying animals. Lined up as if for slaughter, though this, of course, could also have represented similar structures built within the valley of the Nile that have long since vanished. Like the Victorian's appropriation of elements of medieval Venetian architecture to decorate the buildings of 19th century England, the Influence of Uruk on the Nakwadans was limited to pattern and to style. So, though beautifully bonded brickwork was intrinsic to the form and structure of both Venetian palaces and Uruk temples, the Nakwadan bricklayers, like the followers of Ruskin, 
simply imitated the patterns that the original bondings had produced. Thus, in comparison with the originals, the Nakwadan imitations of Uruk facades were as ponderous as the Victorians' mock Venetian architecture. Their builders simply piling up enormous stacks of bricks to produce elephantine. Facsimiles of a foreign, traditional design that had originally made elegant and economic use of the available materials. Historians have traditionally concluded that the Nakwadans had taken up Uruk's monumental architectural imagery because of exotic connotations of prestige and power, and, indeed, Nakwadans visiting Abu Bakabira on the Euphrates could hardly have failed to notice the city's mile-long decorated walls. The Nakwadans, however, were nothing if not discriminating. Everything that entered the charmed environment of the Nile Valley passed through local filters of choice, rejection and adaptation, a continual process, also, of reinvention that would continue throughout all stages of pharaonic history, nor did the Nakwadans build Mesopotamian fortifications or temples in the time of the first pharaohs. When the court's craftsmen were engaged in creating a courtly culture, one in which foreign forms were bent to serve local purposes, just as they had taken over the Sharik sign and used it to hold the names of their kings, so they now magnified that same device and appropriated it simple, strong and easily. Manufactured forms to designate the architecture of their individual courtly culture. It is unlikely, however, that the great tomb of Nakata was built to house the burial of a king, for the tombs of the first kings have all been found within a single separate cemetery, and they are entirely different. Tombs such as the one De Morgan found at Nakata, as later excavation has confirmed, were a distinct group of monuments, and most of them were built in the region of Memphis. House officials of the court and were colorfully decorated known today as Mastabas from an Arabic word for bench, most of these great tombs contain the produce and equipment of rich estates, along with little treasure. Troves of courtly manufactured goods in an elaborate burial chamber. To that extent, at least, the Mastabat Nakata seems to have been exceptional, for its contents appear to have been far richer in exotic objects than those built in the north. Traditional historians, indeed, speculate that this unique building was made for Queen Nithotep, who had been born at Nakata of the ruling family and who was married to King Narma as part of a military coalition, and was the mother of King Aha, for Aha's officials, so some of the ceilings, what appeared to show, had overseen her burial. The hard truth, however, is that we have no evidence that, at its beginning, the throne of the pharaonic state was held in dynastic succession, no evidence either of the institutions of marriage or strategic alliance, nor indeed the slightest knowledge of prehistoric politics. Nothing but our modern understanding of the world, and the charred remains of an ancient, burnt-out tomb. 17. A Line of Kings The First Dynasty Royal Tombs, 3000 to 2825 BC King Narmer and his seven immediate successors to the throne were entombed in a dramatic series of subterranean chambers set into the desert of Abydos. It is a magic place, an open, four-mile semicircle in the valley's western cliff that, like those at Thebes and Hierakonpolis, holds the dust of evening sunset in a golden cloud. Only at Abydos, though, is there a hidden wadi that runs down from the high plateau into the valley of the Nile. And sometimes, as you struggle, through the dunes that fill that lonely place, your lungs filled with hot dry air, the loose sand all around you makes an eerie music, like the sound of organ pipes. The royal cemetery was situated on the flat stage at the center of this natural amphitheater, right on the wadi's flood fan, pitted by plunderers and excavations, and blurred by drifts of wind-blown sand, the site was so deeply strewn in ancient bricks and sherds that the local villagers called it the mother of pots, the um el -Qayab. Here, then, all histories of the pharaonic state begin. Here it was that the better part of our present knowledge of the first Egyptian kings was found. Petrie went to excavate on the um el -Qayab in the winter of 1899. Following in the footsteps of a French coptologist, Emile Milano, 
and a hundred local workmen who had been ripping through Vitus ancient cemeteries for the previous three winter seasons, digging up to thirty tombs a day, using some of the ancient wood from the royal burial chambers to fuel the expeditions cooking stoves and on occasion smashing the growing stock of ancient pots and vases to ensure that the perfect objects which Emiliano had Selected for the European sale rooms would also be unique, bringing his extraordinary talents to bear on what he later described as a piteous ruin, Petri. We cleared and resurveyed the royal tombs on the MLQA Ab in two winter seasons, and during those same years compiled a lucid two volume account off work that included the first accurate list of the first eight pharaohs, Narmer, Aha, Jurenjed, Dan, Andijib, Semarket, and Qaya. Even before Emilino had visited Abidus, the MLQA have had suffered considerable destruction. Like the Nakata Mastaba, most of the royal tombs had been fired and plundered in deep antiquity, and some had been soaked in part dissolved by floodwaters from the desert gully. The early Christian communities of Upper Egypt had attacked the tombs as well, for they were frightened by the demons that were thought to inhabit such empty pagan places in which, as one, of the priest's wrote, could be heard screaming in the desert in the winter night. Then came Emilino. In truth, his methods were not untypical of his time. His great misfortune was to be followed out of Bidus by an innovative genius at the height of his powers who was given to making scathing comments about lesser mortals. At all events, the Frenchman had the pick of what treasures yet remained among the broken tombs, packing crates of goods off to the Cairo. Museum and the Parisian sale rooms, saving souvenirs for friends and reserving the finest pieces for the Louvre, including a magnificent and perfectly designed five-foot royal stella. Cut from creamy limestone, it bears an elaborate cerique. Topped by a hawk and contains the image of a snake, the hieroglyph from which the royal name of Jed is part derived. Once this stella had marked the tomb of Narmer's third successor, one special treasure that Emilino collected was a considerable hull of pots and dishes of stone, many of them very small and shaped with the same exquisite care and sensibility that had informed the finest work of the Nakwaden. Potters. Polished to a rare perfection, not, that is, to a mechanical high shine, but to a texture that resembles human skin, enclosed in their museum cases. They still glow with desert color. Some, too, yet possess their fitments of fine. Gold, yellow lids as stiff and straight as playing cards and handles made from. Twisted wires wound prettily around pots cut from blocks of amethyst, serpentine, and porphyry, rock crystal and fine breccias, flint, basalts and siltstone in the most beautifully variegated alabasters. Emilino, however, worked in haste, and so his workmen only dug a path. Of the tomb UJ and missed its real treasure, the oldest hieroglyphic imagery Thoth has been found in Egypt. He also missed, as Petrie found to his delight, the lower section of a human arm still garlanded with bracelets. These bracelets are elaborately composed in ridged and rounded beads of gold and polished amethyst of lapis lazuli and turquoise, some of them cut into the shape of little cerics, topped by a lively image of a hawk, such as Nakwad and craftsmen had made for centuries past. One of Petrie's workmen had seen the severed arm, wrapped in ancient linen and jammed between the mud bricks of a burial. Chamber wall. Hidden, perhaps, by a one-time robber who had not returned to collect his loot, its archaeological dislocation made it impossible to know the tomb from which the arm had come, that a museum curator later threw the bones. Away along with their linen wrappings has since rendered it impossible to know. If the four bracelets had been worn by a woman or a man, and yet the little treasures by themselves provide a glimpse of what once was buried in the um. al Qayab, especially when it is recalled that, at one time, the royal graveyard had held at least a thousand tombs. Though earthly treasures pleased the patrons who had subsidized his work, Petrie was not after gold but history, and so the previous ravishment of the site had not discouraged him at all. Over those two long seasons, Petrie later estimated, he and his five co-workers had examined a hundred thousand fine-worked vase fragments and drawn hundreds of fragmented seal impressions.
most of which had originated from the bulky, cone-shaped ceilings that had closed the open mouths of storage jars, often more than 18 inches in diameter and weighing up to 15 pounds, the varying textures and colors of these ceilings, so Petrie noted, suggested that they had been made up and sealed in many different locations. Many, indeed, would appear to bear the names of Delta Estates, though, in reality, their contemporary meanings remain elusive. Petrie recovered considerable quantities of other ancient goods as well, a variety of ancient woods, often burned and splintered and some of it carved so as to resemble woven reeds in the manner of much early furniture. And there were furniture legs as well, in the familiar form of bull's legs carved in bone and ivory, in copper pans and dishes and mountains of ceramics, mostly fragments of the standardized storage jars, some of which bore serifs with a royal name. Some of the pots still held the remains of animal fat, more rarely, some elegant. Levantine containers held the remnants of what appeared to have been vegetable oils. Such produce was delivered to these tombs in enormous quantities. Petrie said that the sand in parts of the cemetery was still dark and perfumed. From this colossal wreck, Petrie recovered and registered everything he thought of interest from two perfectly preserved hairpieces, still with their rows of curls, to tiny fragments of faience and gold foil. And always, and especially, he recorded anything that bore designs or hieroglyphs, and, in these great tombs, they were everywhere, signs for numbers, signifying one in ten, hundreds and thousands, dates and names, the scrambled cursive fragments of the bookkeeping and accounts of the court's traffic of supply, were engraved on tiny tags of bone and ivory, impressed on mud seals and scribbled onto the wet clay of new night storage jars. As well as this, there were hundreds of other fragments that bore perfect and precisely drawn hieroglyphs. Some, like the Stella of King Jet, were arranged in beautifully balanced sets, their individual hieroglyphs as carefully made as ever they would be in later history. Others, though far smaller, and carved on wood. In ivory, on furniture and stone dishes, were as precisely made. There were some lively picture plaques as well, a few of them in fine condition, others smashed to fragments, and all of them drawn with the same clarity and style that would decorate the walls of tombs and temples for the following two thousand years. Scenes of royal smiting, of the kings at oval, courts, kings seated on thrones, kings running and overseeing executions, and there were elaborate images of bound-up captives, and people whose carefully recorded appearance, in later ages, would designate them as non-Egyptians. Yet hardly anything remained intact, and it is impossible today to reconstruct the best part of the objects of which these fragments had once formed a part, a million fragments from a broken treasury. A treasury, however, that in the variety and richness of these remaining splinters shows that in the times of the first. Fair as the quality of craftsmanship was already at the highest level. Fragments, too, that in their richness, tell us that the role of the first kings within. Their realm was now a world apart from other people. Reconstructing ancient Abydus. In 1977, Werner Kaiser, a Munich Egyptologist, undertook the re-excavation and conservation of the Um LQA Abed Abydus a task that might at first appear to be a thankless one. Yet the techniques of archaeology had greatly changed since Petrie's day and in the richly funded final decades of the 20th century the necessary resources were available. And so, to date, most of the ten known royal tombs upon the Um El Qayab have been re-excavated, cleared out and restored. And many of the enormous embankments of sand and chip thrown up by Previous excavations, which were still loaded with considerable quantities of ancient things, have been re-examined, and in the process, new swathes of history have been recovered from the preserving desert. In many ways, Kaiser is Petrie's natural successor. In the 1950s, when Egyptology was still driven by traditional language studies and there was little interest in pre-literary ages beyond the sporadic excavation of the Mastabazat. Takara, he had undertaken a fundamental reformation and refinement of
Petri Sequence Dating System. Later, as director of the German Archaeological Institute in Cairo, while he initiated the reinvestigation of the early royal cemeteries of Abydos, he also oversaw the scientific publication of the prehistoric sites at Mahdi, Miranda, and Awan. He also established a long-term excavation on the Isle of Elephantine at Aswan, where 3,000 years of fascinating provincial archaeology was packed sheet by Zhao and Adabitis. Apart from reinvestigating the early royal tombs, Petrie's original excavations have been extended into the nearby Nakwaden cemeteries. As a result, German archaeologists have recovered a five-century-long sequence of graves from the modest tombs of early Nakwaden times to the cemetery that includes the tomb Hui, which lies less than a hundred yards from the later royal tombs of the Amal Kok. That King Narmer's tomb or, at least, the structure at which various loose objects that bear his name were excavated, lies between the cemetery which includes tomb UJ and the later royal tombs, had led to the suggestion that the early cemetery was the burial place of pre-dynastic kings. Narmer's tomb, indeed, is in that same tradition, for it is a simple, thin-walled mud brick construction, half buried in the sand. Built in two separate phases, the tomb is composed of two interlinking pits some 26 feet long and lined with rough plastered, flimsily stacked mud bricks, and roofed, as the remaining impressions made in the drying mud still show, by a ceiling of mats and mud. Plaster supported by wooden beams laid across the chamber's walls. Close by this modest monument, the German archaeologists recovered some decorated Inlays of ivory and bone, one of which bore Narmer's name. They are similar to other pieces found by Milano and Petri, and one day, perhaps, all of them will be reunited in a unique object, a box of ivory and ebony from the grave of Egypt's founding pharaoh, may be reconstructed. Many of the thin walls of these early tombs had bowed, and some had collapsed, this in all probability following the rare rainstorms and flash floods that ran down the desert gully. The tomb of Aha, Narmer's successor to the throne, shows the ancient builder's answer to this problem, for here, inside each of the royal burial pits, three large, equal and equidistant rectangles, the royal builders stacked up five layers of stout mud bricks as regularly and massively as they had done at the Mastaba at Nakata. Slowly, then, the pharaoh's burial vaults were transformed from a set of Temporary walls into a substantial work of subterranean architecture. And, though, in later tombs, the original elements of this design would be elaborated and enlarged, from now on the tomb of Aha was the way they liked it. Its design formed the basis of a program of intelligent and inventive change which would continue in the classical manner of pharaonic culture throughout the construction of the tombs of his successors. So, in the royal tombs that followed Ahaz on the Um El Qaab, those three stout chambers were transformed into a series of great, grand burial chambers, some of them more than 30 feet in length, with ceilings supported by joists set up on great brick piers. Rain by rain, the royal crypts were cut ever deeper into the desert, and slowly, too, their interiors took on the appearance of a court, several of them being given floors and walls of wood. One at least had granite. Paving brought from the cataract at Aswan, the first known use of this material. As building stone in Egyptian history. Then too, stairways were made to run. Down into these burial chambers and stone portcullises were set within them that. Could be lowered after the burial had taken place. And small side rooms were. Also built beside these staircases. One of which, at least, had statues set within it an arrangement reminiscent of some of the tombs made several centuries earlier. In mid nakwaden times, within the Wadi at Hierakonpolis, the most striking of all of these elaborations were the long lines of little mud-brick chambers built around the central royal tomb, which had held subsidiary burials. Though neither Narmer's tomb nor any of the earlier Nakwaden, graves appear to have had these satellite cemeteries, King Aha's tomb already had three rows of them, a solemn procession of dark squared chambers set out in.
measured lines, whose staring open shapes cut into the soft sand are reminiscent of a modern sculpture. More than thirty of these pits were set into the desert. Beside King Aha's grave, their occupants accompanied in death by two young lions, not the little crystal sculptures such as were buried in the contemporary Nakata Masabo, but animals of flesh and bone, killed and buried amid the rows of human graves. The next royal burial chamber to be built, that of King Jir, had seven trenches set around it, each one with thin brick walls that were, in turn, divided into grid-like cells that made three hundred burial vaults. Though these numbers lessened in the following reigns, subsidiary graves were sometimes placed between the brick piers within the royal burial chambers, and the names of some of the individuals who were buried in them were painted in red paint onto the yellow plastered walls. Though hardly any bodies from these graves have been examined by modern pathologists, it seems certain that many if not all of the people for whom these little graves were made were killed for burial with the king. It seems unlikely. After all, that a king's tomb would have been reopened after burial, the poor is raised, the burial chamber penetrated, simply to entomb someone in a subsidiary vault, while the lines of tombs set around the royal grave share common roofs. This would imply that all the burials beneath took place at the same time. Another indication of communal burial is that the names of some of these unfortunates were painted and engraved on very similarly sized stones in groups of images that are so alike in quality and dimensions that these sad memorials appear to have been made at the same time. There is no evidence, however, that this considerable slaughter was accompanied by acts of ceremony such as are portrayed upon the armor. Palette. No evidence of smiting or dismemberment of the corpses has been found. From their accompanying inscriptions, the occupants of these little tombs appear to have been courtiers perhaps, and craftsmen, and members of the royal household. Judging by their names, the majority of them may also have been women. The presence of dried blood in some of the surviving teeth appears to show that some of these unfortunates were strangled before they were placed into their graves. Other analyses suggest that, on occasion, poison may have been used. Unlike the massive Masabas at Saqqara, there is hardly any trace of how the Graves on the young Lqaab, royal and non-royal alike, were marked upon the surface of the desert beyond a handful of great stone steely holding the kings. Names, which appear to have been set up to mark the presence of their tombs. Small fragments of plastered brick and matting recovered by the German. Archaeologists suggest that the king's burial chambers may have been covered by rectangles of sand, mud and matting, in the manner of the largest Nakwaden. Graves at Hierakonpolis. As for the subsidiary tombs, unlike Saqqara, where the little burials that surround the great brick mass abbas were usually marked in some way, none of the smaller tombs within the royal cemetery appeared to have been marked by even the briefest of external architecture. A mile from the Um al Qayab, however, set between the royal cemetery and the ancient settlement that lay beside the cultivated land, first Petrie and later. An expedition from the University of Pennsylvania uncovered the foundations of a cluster of massive mud brick enclosures that gave an entirely new dimension to the royal burial arrangements on the Um al Qayab, made in the time of the first kings, at 500 feet in length, with walls that, by comparison with better preserved examples built in the following dynasty, had once stood to a height of some 40 feet. The largest none of these enclosures could have accommodated the entire Cemetery on the Um al Qayab. Though others may yet be discovered, the earliest known and, at just 110 feet long and 70 feet wide, the smallest of them, appears to have been built in the time of King Aha. Though modern plans now show these great enclosures clustered side by side, each of them appears to have stood for only a short period of time before it was dismantled, its building materials perhaps incorporated in the nearby enclosures of its successors in the manner of some of the later royal mortuary temples. The seemingly temporary nature of these enclosures suggests that they may have housed activities connected with royal funerals. To the archaeologists, chagrin, 
However, the excavation and re-excavation of their interiors has yielded very little. Outside the walls of these enclosures, though, all set in rows like the subsidiary burials on the MLQA app, further burials have been excavated. Some of them provided with exotic goods and fine jewelry, others basic and austere, while similar pits even contain the burials of some hard-worked donkeys. And in the 1980s, to everyone's surprise, a fleet of buried boats was found near these enclosures, 14 yellow painted craft, each one some 70 feet in length and all of them encased in brick and all of them moored with limestone anchors in the driest of deserts. Such evidence suggests that these temporary enclosures were used by the royal court and that the associated burials of people, boats and donkeys were part of a system of supply. For the fact that similar buildings were built two centuries later at Hierakonpolis, a site that never held a pharaoh's grave, shows that these grand enclosures were not specifically designed for royal funerals. Though enormous of themselves, such elephantine constructions made of sun-dried mud brick would not have been a major drain on court resources. Similar arrangements, indeed, may well have been built at various points along the lower now to hold the produce of the estates of the Delta and of Upper Egypt Ash. Arrangements that may well be reflected in later texts, some of which mention docks and warehouses of Memphis of the White Walls while others specifically refer to storehouses in the vicinity of Abydos, a term that is reflected to this day in the local Arabic name for one of these enclosures as the Shunet el Zibib, the Raisin Storehouse. At Abydos, then, Beside the royal tombs and far from the court center in the region of Memphis, such architectural arrangements may well have served as reception centers in which to stockpile and protect the mass of goods being gathered from all up and down the lower Nile for emplacement in the new made royal tomb. Certainly, it is precisely such elaborate processes of checking and distribution that are reflected in the mass of scribblings and ceilings found within the tombs themselves. Some of the ceilings found in the royal tombs, indeed, show that some of these activities were under the control of the same people who were managing the royal estates within the delta and who were themselves buried in the great tombs at Saqqara, close by the dockyards and enclosures that supplied the living court, rather than serving the mundane functions of magazines and storerooms. However, these grand enclosures at Abydos are usually described in traditional Histories is being built as theaters to hold as yet undefined and undetected rites, which, on the basis of later hieroglyphic texts, are imagined to have accompanied the first pharaonic burials. Indeed, it is these later texts that still inspire the continued reinvestigation of the grand enclosures, as archaeologists search for traces of pharaonic ritual, though at first glance these two differing interpretations might appear to be at odds. In reality they need not have been mutually exclusive. In this silent, preliterary age, however, it would seem more appropriate to proceed, as Wittgenstein once observed, not from certain words, but from the traces of genuine activity. So, leaving aside the primitive superstitions that are often given as the inspiration for such ancient monuments, it is clear that, whatever else it may have represented, this huge gathering of royal burial chambers and enclosures and subsidiary burials in the deserts at Abydos was part of the same system of supply, accommodation and provisioning that these kings had overseen in life. These great enclosures, therefore, could also have served as accommodation for the living court and for the tomb makers and craftsmen while they prepared the great tombs to house the royal burial. We may well imagine, therefore, that the internal facilities of these great enclosures were similar to the buildings beside the courts set up throughout the land that were used for acts of royal ceremonial or for tithing and slaughtering. Nor should it seem surprising that the death of kings should occupy such a great part of their court's attention. In life, their very role had been part defined by death, while the elaborate reactions to the king's demise was simply and quite Logically a continuation of the order and functions of the very culture of the living court. Histories and kings. It was Flinders Petrie who, 
by comparing the positions and contents of the Abidus tombs with later ancient lists of pharaohs, had first set the eight kings, who were buried on the Um El Qa Ab in the order of their succession. It was not until Kaiser reopened those earlier excavations after seventy years, however, that the accuracy of Petrie's reconstruction was confirmed with the recovery of two contemporary king lists. The first of these remarkable documents was gleaned from the partial impressions of a single cylinder seal on five fragments of dark gray clay which had been used to seal the lids of jars found in the tomb of King Den. One of these, a nondescript chip of dried mud barely an inch high, had been found by Petrie and is now in London. The other four were recovered by the German Archaeological Institute from the tomb itself and are now stored at Abidus. When put together in a single composite drawing they named the first five kings. In order of their succession, Narmer, Aha, Jer, Jet, and Den, a list to which was added the name of a woman, Marneith, whose tomb had also been set in the Royal Cemetery of the Um El Qa'ab, at just thirty feet in length, Marneith's burial chamber, which Petrie describes as finely built and well-made dash had been relatively modest, but Merneith was buried with the panoply of King's Inn. So is usually described, in the European manner, as a queen regnant. For Merneith, it would appear, had flourished during the first part of the lengthy reign of Den, who, it is assumed, had been too young to reign alone. The second, larger king list, in which Merneith's name does not appear, was gleaned from a still larger number of impressions, shiny fragments of dried silt had, had been so finely sieved as to look like sealing wax. These, it seemed, had been broken from the ceilings of some leather bags placed in the tomb of King Qa. When the partial impressions of this single seal were put together once again, they were found to list no fewer than eight successive kings, which both confirmed and extended the older, shorter list. That both these lists start with the name of Narmer showed that, in the times of his near contemporaries, at least, if not in those of later pharaohs when that name is never mentioned, Narmer was regarded as the first king of the pharaonic state, the man, therefore, that we would consider as its founder. And yet, however great a warrior or unifier or ritualist this Narmer may have, then, one reign by itself cannot represent the establishment of the unique office that the compilers of those two king lists celebrate in their seal engravings. Such lists, it would appear, were elaborate versions of a contemporary preoccupation, for at this same time many shorter versions were also cut onto a range of fine stone vases, the names of just two or three kings written in different hands, one following another. At the same time, too, this same line of rulers was literally and most obviously advertised in the row of mast abbas set on the horizon. At Saqqara, set out in a wide variety of media, such insistent representations of a line of kings represent a conscious historical awareness of the continuity of the office, and an order that, in life and death, was the embodiment of the pharaonic state. Whatever the physical relationship of one pharaoh to his predecessor may have, then, and there is as yet, no hard evidence of what that may have been, it was. This fundamental concept of a line of kings that enabled the office of the pharaoh itself to take on the aspect of an entity that has existence of itself in which, like Keats's immortal nightingale, was not born for death. It was at once a novel and an entirely artificial creation. Before those eight named kings, there is hardly any evidence of the conscious cultivation of an historical communal identity along the valley of the lower Nile beyond that, which the Nakwaden burial parties had left in the cemeteries. With the coming of the kings, however, the culture and continuity of their kingdom would be continuously and most scrupulously defined by generations of court craftsmen, scribes and builders. These lists, therefore, represent nothing less than the invention of a new order and identity within human society and a great part of that order was forged and held within the narrow valley of the lower Nile, beside the great slow river, Egypt Shaka, Manithal and the dynasties. Not only were the Egyptians conscious of a long history but they tried very seriously to come to terms with it.
No Near Eastern society was more meticulous in its record keeping. John Van Setters, 1983. When Petrie had begun his excavations at Abydos in the last year of the 19th century, contemporary historians could only describe the entire history of ancient Egypt before the building of the pyramids in a few short pages. Little more was known about the early kingdom than a few ancient enigmatic king lists and some classical scraps and stories, many of which quoted a Greek text called the Egypt Shaka, which is now lost but, as it was generally regarded by classical historians as the soundest of their sources for the ancient history of Egypt, is fragmentarily preserved in their quotations in their comments. The Egypt Shaka appears to have been written in the Great Library of Alexandria in the 3rd century BC by one Manithou, an Egyptian priest and one of a group of scholars in that learned institution who were compiling histories of the ancient cultures of the pre-classical world. Manithou appears to have been a man on something of a mission. Some of the surviving fragments of his work are critical of the considerable errors and inaccuracies he had found in earlier Greek accounts of Egypt. Indeed, he is portrayed as having traveled to Alexandria from his hometown in the Delta especially to represent the living ancient culture of his country to the city of the Greeks. The bits of the Egypt Shaka that survive are but a series of tiny narratives laid over a list of kings such as ancient Egyptian scribes had compiled since earliest times. Manithou's history, however, was composed in Greek and written for a Hellenistic audience. So, at the same time that these capsule histories emphasize such traditionally pharaonic concerns as the making of sacred statues and the building of temples, they also present ancient Egypt to the Hellenistic world as a holy kingdom of unfathomable antiquity as a kingdom of architects and astronomers where medicine and writing were invented, a kingdom gifted by gods, ruled by heroes and attacked by foreigners. Nonetheless, modern archaeology has shown that the chronological framework of Manithou's history, its list of rulers, is remarkably accurate. Certainly, the priests read hieroglyphs, which, in his day, had been in use for more then three millennia and would continue to be used on public monuments for six further centuries. So, one of his commentators tells us, Manithou had access to some king lists written out on leather or papyrus, and he probably also used some of the state records that had been inscribed on a variety of stone blocks centuries after the time of the first kings. So, though the age of Shaka in his present broken form contains errors and obscurities, it yet reflects the historical knowledge of his own country as it was perceived in classical times by an educated patriot and is, therefore, a genuine and touching record of old Egypt. For Egyptologists, however, the overriding contemporary significance of the Egypt Chaka is that, for better or worse, Manithou divided the kings of ancient Egypt into successive dynasties a handy jargon that subdivides a succession of 165 major pharaohs into 30 odd numbered groups of kings, and an innovation for which there appears to have been no precedent at all, rather than appearing as an alien imposition upon the order of the distant past, however, Manitou's system not only pinpoints disturbed periods of rapid change in which his dynasties come and go in very quick succession, but also reflects several long-life familial lines that are known from other sources to have held the throne of Egypt for considerable periods of time. Manithou's scheme, therefore, appears to have been a genuine historical perception of the order and succession of the ancient kings, and it is certainly a very great convenience. So, though many of Manithou's dynasties may not have been dynasties in the sense that we would use that word today, they are universally employed, for as Rector Roland, the 18th century historian of ancient Egypt, observes, they help us to avoid a confusion of the times. 18. The Lost Dynasty. Fake Histories, Real Lives, Dynasty 2, 2825 to 2675 BC. The Appearance, at around 3000 BC, of a dynasty of eight named kings one. Following the other might, at first, appear to signal the ending of Egyptian prehistory.
After a century and a half, however, this regular royal lineage disappears. It is as if the history of the newly founded kingdom had run into an alpine tunnel and emerged in an entirely different landscape. At the tunnel's entrance stands the first dynasty of kings, all named and buried in good order in their subterranean cemetery at Abydos, surrounded by the graves of murdered court officials. At the tunnel's exit, however, at the beginning of the third dynasty, Human sacrifice at royal burials had stopped, the classical ancient Egyptian. Courtly arts were at a peak of excellence, and the state bureaucracy was. Embarking on the construction of the first Egyptian pyramid, a freestanding. Structure some 200 feet high entirely made from blocks of stone whose. Manufacture had employed more than a thousand people. Thus, in that dark. Tunnel, Narmer's Nakwad and Principate had been transformed into the kingdom of. The pharaohs. Most ancient history is pieced together from flashes of information that light. Up the landscapes of the distant past like the flashes of a thunderstorm. There is. But precious little left to illuminate the life and times of the early pharaohs. However, in the period known as the Second Dynasty is especially dark. Evidence of its court and kings is presently contained within a few partial and. Broken monuments and a mass of brief ambiguous descriptions. Most of the monarchs of the time are little more than names. There is no firm chronology off your succession and thus the landscapes of traditional history cannot be established. In great part, this hiatus is due to the fact that most of the kings of the second dynasty abandoned the royal burial ground at Abydos and moved their cemetery up onto the plateau of Saqqara, the great wide desert plain which became the greatest courtly cemetery of ancient Egypt. So the royal tombs of this elusive dynasty were swept away by later builders, and all that now remains of them are some corridors excavated in the rock beneath the desert, a half dozen mazes with slope sided storerooms set around some central chambers that may once have held the royal burials, empty or still awaiting excavation, and often lying underneath later tombs and chapels, even the names of some of the kings for whom these subterranean apartments appear to have been made are as yet unknown. No tombs, no history. For, in the supply economy of the early ancient Egyptian court, building tombs in their accompanying architecture in the preserving landscapes of the valley's deserts now represents the best part of the early court's activities. So traditional historians are forced to compile their king. Lists from much later sources, some royal names engraved on bowls and dishes, a handful of seal impressions, and a list of three kings scratch one after the other, on the shoulder of a little granite statue, for just two named rulers of this vague period had funerary monuments made on their behalf on the Om al Avat, Abidus, and thus their names achieve a kind of substance. And so, it would appear that, halfway through the second dynasty, the Builders of one of these pharaohs, a certain King Peribson, cut a rather modest rectangular burial chamber close to the tombs of the first dynasty of kings and lined him in the traditional way, with sun-dried mud brick. At the ending of this hidden dynasty, the court builders of another king, one Kasekamoy, followed the same pattern, building a similarly unpretentious chamber to which was later added a long line of storerooms that appear to reproduce in mud brick the arrangements of the rock-cut magazines of the near-contemporary Saqqara. Tombs. Kasekamoy's tomb, however, suffered heavy damage in the king's own lifetime. Excavated in the desert's underlying gravels, the tomb chamber and storerooms had been set into a long, wide trench which soon served as a conduit for a flash flood which had washed down from the high desert, part dissolving and greatly weakening the tomb's sun-dried mud bricks. So the royal workforce had returned to buttress the sodden walls and also to rebuild the royal burial chamber in limestone, in the manner of the Saqqara tombs. Here, though, unlike Saqqara, there was no underlying rock within easy reach, so the builders imported blocks of quarried stone to remake the royal burial chamber, and built the first known stone block structure in all Egypt as the last king to build a tomb on the Um al-Qa'ab, Kasekamoy's 
accompanying brick enclosure down on the plain below was not dismantled like its predecessors, and so it still survives, set alongside the foundations of the earlier enclosures and the largest of them all. It is a dramatic, dark, imposing structure with two buttressed, battered and part plastered enclosing walls some 16 feet thick and more than 35 feet high, two framing rectangles set, one inside the other, enclosing an area the size of a football pitch. In common with the other earlier enclosures, archaeologists have found scant evidence of contemporary structures inside Kosekamoy's enclosure. At Hierakonpolis, however, the similarly massive building which was also built during Kosekamoy's reign, the so-called Fort of Hierakonpolis, was found to hold the remains of formal architecture, parts of which had been made of blocks of granite. Some of these blocks were decorated with reliefs holding both the royal name and some groups of figures that are similar to, though larger and more formal than those drawn on the little picture plaques. That there are no traces of a royal burial of this period at Hierakonpolis underlines the fact that these grand enclosures were not made exclusively for Royal funerals, along with the recent discovery of near contemporary ceremonial activity within the nearby oval court and the cache of objects found by Cobell. In green, some of which bear Kasekamoy's name, the fort stands as physical evidence of a continuing royal progress of tithing and appearance through the ancient kingdom, a progress in which the great enclosure served as Focus and enduring testimony of the royal presence at the settlement. Such architectural enterprises during Kasekamoy's reign may also have included a rough stone walled enclosure which still stands in the desert at Takara, for pottery found at the site was made at about the time he ruled. Almost a third of a mile long, this largely buried in highly enigmatic rectangle. And the desert is further evidence of the enlarging royal building program that was taking place. It is, as well, a powerful indicator of the growing efficiency of the court supply system during the late Second Dynasty, part of an economic history that is underlined by Petrie's discovery of some jar ceilings in Kasekamoy's tomb on the Um El Qayyad, which show that a part at least of the king's burial goods were installed by the officials of King Djoser, his successor, for whom the first Egyptian pyramid was built. Let me call you sweetheart? How? Then, to recover a coherent courtly narrative for the Second Dynasty of Kings? Traditionally, Egyptological histories have been compiled, as the great Egyptologist Sir Alan Gardner described, from an avowedly philological point of view, that is, from inscribed papyri and inscriptions, that so few texts exist. From the period of the early dynasties, however, has left traditional historians to shift as best they can translating such signs and objects as have survived as if they held the meanings of the later hieroglyphs. In similar fashion, the group of signs drawn on some fragments found by the tomb close to that of Aha and the Um El Qayyab were translated as sweetheart, a common popular term at the time of Petrie's excavations. Working on the assumption that the signs may also have been a name, Petrie and his co-workers proposed that it had belonged to one of Aha's daughters, and they formally transcribed it as Burner Ib, more recently, as you might imagine, Ahaz. Sweetheart has also been described as a concubine or queen, yet there is no firm indication that the signs which make up Sweetheart's name were in fact a name at all. Sweetheart, indeed, which has been recently rendered as one who is pleasant at heart, could just as well be an official title, a royal epithet or none of the above and there is nothing that would indicate Sweetheart's sex. Nonetheless, the narratives that such translations imply can spin most. Wondrous tales. Take King Peribson, for example. Impressions on jar ceilings. Found at his abidus tomb show the royal serik topped, not by the usual hawk, but by a monstrous beast that Egyptologists describe as the Seth animal and identify as a manifestation of the state god of that same name. Now, in tales of the later religion, Seth appears as the rapist and uncle of Horus and the murderer of his own brother, Osiris. Could it not be that such disturbing stories, in the course of which Seth assumes the form of a black pig, and tears out young Horus' eye, 
who in turn castrates him, reflect more earthly struggles in this. Primitive age? Or, alternatively, was poor Peripson a fervent worshipper of? The evil Seth, as several other historians suggest? Such speculations are underpinned by the common assumption that sudden. Gaps in courtly history like those presently afflicting the Second Dynasty were the product of civic violence, a view encouraged in this instance by some other. Sailings from Peribson's tomb bearing a word that may mean tribute or perhaps the conqueror. Peribson's name is rarely found in excavations as far north as Saqqara, and this has further suggested that he ruled only in the South Dash. Hence, therefore, his tomb is at Abidus rather than Saqqara with the other kings of his time. In similar vein, the fact that the Seth animal on some of Peribson's ceilings may be named as Ash, a name that has connection with Libyan deities. Associated with Seth, even provides him with an invading international enemy to fight, for Seth, after all, was the sometime god of foreigners. Like all good fantasies, it all ends happily enough, on this occasion at Byblus. In the Lebanon, where, according to another legend, the murdered body of Osiris fetched up on the beach, and where, in the 1920s, French archaeologists excavated some fragments of a stone vase showing Horus and Seth standing peaceably together on top of a single serique which contains the name of Kase Kamoy, a sure sign that, in this delirious maze of myth and mistranslation, peace had broken out within the warring dynasty, that upper and lower pharaoh land had been united once again, and, as an extra bonus, that Kasekamoy had revived trading missions to the Levant. Huge histories built upon the thinnest evidence, from anthroponomy to history. As the oldest, richest and most successful of all ancient cultures, the Pharaonic state had a remarkable reputation throughout the later ancient world. Thus, in the Old Testament, the land of Egypt is shown as the home of a uniquely splendid court with much wealth and powerful mystery, a pungent biblical description that has influenced the order and the role of Western governments down to this day. And so, with crowns and kings, with fighters, sweethearts and defenders, we conjure easy stories about boy princes and heroic queens, warring generals, and wily priests. Such stories gain acceptance as a kind of truth because they provide comfy pedigrees, pseudo-scientific prefigurations even, of standard roles. Within our own society, those qualities, indeed, that are frequently attributed to human nature, and so the shattered relics of old Egypt become shards of a mirror in which we glimpse phantoms of ourselves playing stories from our childhoods, specifically, as far as the history of the Second Dynasty is concerned. Dubious affirmation of such tales is built on two assumptions. First, that the seven hundred odd known inscriptions of the period reflect an ancient court of biblical complexity, and secondly that, though the means of indicating grammar had not yet been invented, all that is required to help those stuttering scribes to tell their tales is to fill the gaps between their images with prepositions. Yet the images and signs that have survived from the period of the second Dynasty were not fragments of a system intended to imitate speech or written narrative. Just as the earliest identifiable hieroglyphs are those signifying numbers, so too the labels, seals and pottery on which the later hieroglyphic images are preserved show that their uses were still restricted to a narrow range of functions within the court's network of supply. They record ownership, checking, accounting and describing the quantities and qualities of things. It would take several centuries for some of these same images to be selected and then be set within the grammatical structures of hieroglyphic texts. To their contemporaries, the combined meanings of these early signs were comprehensible only in the context of the living system of which they were a part, the system that was itself the grammar. Thus, though these archaic signs and images hold a highly restricted range of meanings, they promise histories way beyond the traditional narratives of Western historians. These fragments of an archaic information system, these early signs of patterning and quantifying, are the inadvertent records of a rising order in the early state, the early history of a powerful system of supply that 
eventually enabled the building of the pyramids, and fueled and financed the mature pharaonic state. Right from the time of the tomb Ujadabitis, where the signs and numbers seem only to identify the amount of goods and, perhaps, some elements of their origins, this is a history of elaboration and enlargement. It manifests itself in more complex records like those on Narmer's mace head and the picture plaques of the first dynasty, documents that not only named and numbered ties and offerings but also record the year, the place and the occasion on which the goods were taken into the royal court. Here, then, in the first dynasty of kings, centuries-old accounting methods have been adapted to record data within a living system, so that they are capable of listing events and passing time and of transmitting unique sets of information from one generation to the next, taken. Together, they record patterns of trafficking and tithing down through generations, and are, therefore, a genuine recorded narrative compiled without the aid of abstract or literary conceptions. So though the surviving lists of images and words made in the first two dynasties may not tell us who Aha's sweetheart really was, nor recount Sobi. Tales of harems, marriages or wars, they can inform us of a fundamental development in human history. For these scan inscriptions are the first known. Records of specific events in passing time. History itself was born within the early offices of the pharaonic state. Aswan 1 to 2 to 3 a Hollywood of wars or times of mellow fruitfulness. Whatever else was taking place at the court of the second dynasty of kings, it is clear that the fundamental institutions of pharaonic government, its systems of supply, not only survived throughout that century and a half, but flourished to the extent that, when the kings emerge into the light of history again with the pyramid builders of the third dynasty, the state on the lower Nile was more efficient than it had ever been, that there was, therefore, strong institutional continuity. Hard evidence of this, indeed, which contradicts the usual gloomy rumors of the history of the period, has been found in recent years, in excavations undertaken all over Egypt, from Aswan in the south to Awan in the delta in the north. At Aswan especially, ongoing excavations on the granite outcrop of the cataract provide a marvelous microcosm of the times, and, indeed, of day-to-day -day life throughout the period of the first three dynasties. Aswan always was stone city, though the ancient Egyptians took a variety of stone from other sources, the finest quartzite and best part of the red and black. Granite used by ancient Egyptian builders and sculptors of all periods came from Aswan. Plentiful and of consistent quality, Aswan stone was shipped along the river to all parts of the ancient kingdom. As an organized state enterprise, the quarrying of Aswan granite seems to have started in the rains that followed Narmer, when the hard red stone had first been used as an element in royal architecture and boulders lying close to the river were shipped downstream to the royal building sites. So several speckled spears of gray Aswan granite were erected on the Um El Qa Abed Abidus, which identified the kings within the tombs beneath, the royal names pounded into their shining, water-rounded surfaces. Three centuries later, some of the 50-ton granite blocks used in the interior of the Great Pyramid would still have similarly water-rounded surfaces. And yet later centuries, however, when all the stones suitable for use in building had been taken from the riverside, the quarries were moved half a mile and more back into the hills of the granite outcrop with their broad, near-perfect horizontal seams of rock. And there it was that the Great Owlists and the granite colossi of the pharaohs were extracted, from sites that are still filled with the millennial dust and chips of lives past in the quarrying off hard stone. With its cascading bougainvillea, grand hotels and white falakas, modern. Aswan is not as it once was. Calmed now by two great dams, the last and largest. Of which now forms the city's southern horizon, the river's flow is slow and low. Round the year. In ancient times, However, the annual flood had run so high, so full and fast and overwhelmingly, that the cataract had been impassable in certain months, the so-called autumn boats of ancient texts perhaps describing 
craft adapted to shoot those rapids in such times. In those days, too, the granite. Islands that now stand high and dusty in the slow-flowing stream were but a scattering of rounded rocks and boulders, lying on the belly of a white water. Cataract. Judging by the pottery they left behind, the Nakwadans had lived in small settlements set on the river bank between Hierakonpolis and Aswan alongside the settlements of their Nubian contemporaries. At Aswan, too, though the granite islands were mostly inundated by the annual flood, a small Nakwadan settlement was established on a little outcrop at the ending of the Whitewater, where the river had begun to widen out again to fill the center of the valley. Here, then, on the southern part of what is now the Isle of Elephantine, they set up reed huts and some strips of river silt which had been caught between the granite boulders, and they buried their dead close by, some of them in nicely rounded sinkholes carved by the fast-flowing river, so that eventually archaeologists found fragments of their bones and burial goods broken up and water around it, like pebbles in a stream. Though they fished and, in the traditional way, kept herds of cows, it is unlikely that even this modest settlement could have supported itself on its granite island, where there was precious little vegetation other than that which grew upon a few narrow, silty beaches. One may imagine, then, that the plain of silt the surging river had dropped in the lee of the granite outcrop in which now accommodates the modern city of Aswan, served as their pasture lands, where Animals were grazed and grain was cultivated. By the middle of the 4th millennium BC, when the Nakwadans had begun to sail the river in large, wooden boats, the islanders were using some of the decorated pottery imported from the Nakwadan heartlands. At the same time, they also used the products of Nubian potters, whose wares were common in the settlement. Then, in the last centuries before the kings, a large rectangular Building made of sun-dried mud brick was erected at the middle of the settlement. Some twenty-four feet long and slightly less than half as wide, the building shared the same proportions as some of those which were being erected in the Nile Delta at that time. And, just as those new buildings in the northern settlements had done, the appearance of this structure signals the beginning of a transformation of the island settlement, from a gathering of the random accommodations of subsistence fishermen and farmers to a measured colonization, and at the same time, fragments of the storage and transportation jars that had become the currency of the Nakwadan supply network start to appear. Unlike the contemporary Delta estates, this development could hardly have been concerned with agricultural production, these colonists, it would appear, had come south to Aswan, to this island in the river stream to harvest stone. That, too, is the message of a simple kiln of the same period that was constructed. And the colony, which, though it may have been used for firing pottery, could also have been employed for smelting copper or casting copper tools and so aid in stone extraction and the maintenance of the Nakwadan networks of boats and barges. In the Midfirst dynasty, at around the same time that granite pavements were being introduced into the royal tombs at Abydos, a massive seventy-yard square enclosure built of stacked and bonded brick with high, battered walls was built upon the island's northern end, made in the manner of the architecture of the great contemporary tombs, it was set straight onto the granite boulders and sited so that a tiny beach sheltered by some enormous water-rounded boulders could serve as a key, with fifteen feet thick walls, a grand entrance doorway and an impressive line of semicircular bastions along its sides, the buildings. Plan is reminiscent of some of the fortress-like images carved upon the siltstone. Palettes, later in pharaonic history, Aswan's name would be signified by a similar hieroglyph. There is no archaeological evidence, however, within this considerable ruin, of the presence of a military garrison, nor indeed of any conflict or destruction at the site. Like so many of the splendid architectures of later periods of ancient history that are identified as fortresses, the structure appears to have embodied the resources in the order of the state, at once powerful and protective, in much the same way as the enclosures and great tombs at Saqqara and Abydos. This architecture, though, was for the living.
that it was set directly in. Without regard over the flimsy dwellings of the earlier settlement, the fortresses. Western wall cut over and across the entrance of an ancient shrine, also signals. The blunt intrusion of external authority into an established community, a feature. That once again it shares with several other contemporary buildings in the Nile. Valley and in the Delta. At Aswan, however, and uniquely, it not only marks the southernmost extent of the pharaonic transport network but, as the debris of their workshops implies, the establishment of a state settlement in which families of craftsmen worked hard stone. Both the products of these workshops and the stores that kept the craftsmen and their families supplied with grain and copper, food and tools, seem to have been held inside the fortress's imponent walls. By the mid-second dynasty, so its German archaeologists have shown, the size of the island fortress had been doubled, a wall and tower having been added to its entrance gate and two further walls built out from the fortress's northern and to run some eighty yards down along the edges of the narrowing island and meet at its tip. Inside this new-made triangle of space, the walls enclosed a series of simple mud-brick dwellings all laid out within a carefully measured grid, just as many later pharaonic building projects would be throughout the following millennia. On Elephantine, the grid held just two rows of houses with at least 20 family plots in them, each one a little over 16 and a half feet wide and twice as deep, or, as the state's contemporary surveyors would have expressed it, in the traditional units that were related to the human forearm, plots that were 11 cubits wide and some 22 cubits deep, as well as houses, this grid also accommodated at least six communal spaces, the largest of which was about 150 square feet whilst others were so small that they could only have served as grain bins or cupboards. Some of these spaces were roofed, others left as open yards. Inside the individual housing units, though each of them shared common dividing walls, every one was of a different plan. Those rooms with small windows that were open to the river's evening. Breezes may have been used as bedrooms, others, with little baking ovens, were clearly kitchens, and there were also animal stalls and storage areas. Most were less than six feet high, though many of the housing units also had upper stories, built against the fortress's inner walls. As Aswan is close to the Tropic of Cancer, we may well imagine that the families, who, from the size of the housing grid, could have consisted of three generations at most, sometimes slept up on the open roof. Such were regulated communities, and in later ages many more of them would be built up and down the Nile, live cheek by jowl, so close, indeed, that the narrow passages which gave access to the various family dwellings were set inside the individual housing units. Here, then, public and private spaces were undifferentiated and people would have brushed by one another as they moved round the settlement or indeed from room to room within an individual unit. So, the settlement would probably have appeared as one large dwelling, its external appearance not unlike that of large traditional upper Egyptian houses of the recent past. And the ancient island families use both wind and shade in individual and clever ways, just like their modern counterparts, and with a similar understanding of the excellent insulation afforded by mud architecture. Like the earlier Nakwadan settlement on the same site, this imported community of at least 20 nuclear families living within the first dynasty. Fortress could hardly have been supported from the natural resources of the little island. We may imagine, therefore, that though the river gave them fish in the nearby fields continued to provide grain and cattle pasturage that, as the copious fragments of the large state storage jars suggest, the four-square settlement was part provisioned by the supply systems of the royal court. At all events, the settlement certainly thrived, for after a century or more, at some point in the Third Dynasty, another complex of rather larger, stout-walled dwellings was set up just 130 yards away, on another island, close to the center of the river's stream. Today, both these little islands form part of the southern tip of the modern Isle of Elephantine for they have been joined together by silt brought down in the floods of later centuries. 
In the Third Dynasty, however, they were still apart. And the settlement on the second island, which had been built directly on the rock, was being changed and adapted as circumstances required. Here it was, at the beginning of the next dynasty, that one of these buildings was reduced to dust and rubble and buried within a higher, wider floor, a process which, as its German excavators discovered, had protected the debris of earlier occupation. And, with it, a treasury of information. For here they found a massive seal. Impressions, many of them in coarse clay and broken from the ties of bags and the lids of pottery jars, and other smaller and more delicate sealings that had closed long vanished sheets of papyrus, a common enough writing medium that has entirely disappeared from the archaeological record of those times. Taken altogether, the hieroglyphs on these rare scraps showed that, in the time before the room had been demolished, its occupants had been in contact with the officials at the court of at least one third dynasty monarch, part of a process of communication and supply that, as the tens of thousands of bread molds found in the surrounding area implied, was part concerned with the provisioning of the fortress families and the supply of granite to the court. This demolished building, then, appears to have been a third dynasty. Administrative center, a government office set up within a colony, which, like the Delta Estates, had been a place where goods and supplies had been handled in large quantities. Here, state officials had controlled the delivery and dispatch of comestibles and presumably, at Aswan, the shipping of the dull red stone that the court builders were using in increasing quantities. Such excavations, and there are several others in Egypt, though none that have yielded such richness of detail as those at Aswan, show something of the realities of life within the tunnel of the second dynasty. They show, too, that, though the order of the pharaohs remains unknown, the period had been a time of continuity and growth. Indeed, it was a time in which the craftsmen and officers of the royal court were still engaged in transforming the realm of Narmer and his successors, a world of farmers, both captains and estate managers, into the mighty state machine that would construct the pyramids of Ancient Egypt. 19. The Wheeling Hawk. Refining Egypt, Dynasties 1, 2, and 3. At the same time that the Midfirst Dynasty fortress was being built upon the Isle of Elephantine, Pharaoh's northern networks of trafficking and settlement were being slowly yet drastically transformed, a process that not only served to shape the physical extent of the later kingdom but had a profound effect upon the cultural identity of the court and its attitude towards its neighbors. There are but faint indications of what provokes such transformations, and, as we have already seen, the records of the succeeding Second Dynasty are especially sparse. Something, though, was in the very air. To the north, the Uruk. Settlements in modern-day Syria and Turkey, those considerable fortresses by the Euphrates, were abandoned, while in the Levant, as at Aswan, populations that had previously lived in small and open settlements were moving into larger towns set inside walled enclosures. At this same time, too, the old Nakwaden settlements in the South Levant which had long enjoyed a close relationship with the region's indigenous inhabitants began to shrink, so that by the time of the Second Dynasty they had entirely disappeared. Trading Clichés such drastic realignments are often ascribed to those four horsemen of the Neo-Darwinian apocalypse, plague, invasion, avarice and politics. So pharaohs. Dissolving settlements in the Levant are described as an example of a loss of empire, as something that, in a more modern idiom, had threatened the supply of a number of essential strategic commodities apostrophe burgeoning nation states, so this eerily contemporary narrative continues have growing and indeed imperative requirements for access to a range of strategic raw materials, so the ancient Egyptians needed continued access to box of timber to construct the boats that were such a vital element in the foundation of the Pharaonic Imperium. Such great boats, it is affirmed, would have required wood as straight and massive as that of the great firs and cedars, which grew in the forests of the mountains of the anti-Lebanon, whose timbers,
were certainly imported by the officials of later pharaohs. In similar fashion, the officers of the early kings would also have required plentiful and secure supplies of copper, that essential component of the Nakwaden toolbox, which had long been imported from the South Levant along with further supplies of the red metal that had been mined and smelted in regions even further to the north. Even as the Nakwadans had first moved up along the Nile to Memphis, the scenario continues, there had been moves to protect the flow of these strategic commodities. This, indeed, had been the prime purpose of establishing the settlements within the South Levant, a policy that Narmer's governing elite continued. In the Second Dynasty, however, after these settlements had been abandoned and the native Levantines had moved into larger fortified communities, these trade routes would have been inaccessible, and pharaohs. Officers had therefore taken to the sea, sighting Biblis boats, a term used in later hieroglyphic texts to describe a class of square-rigged seagoing ship, it has been estimated that a voyage from the port of Budo, east and up along the coast to Biblis in the Lebanon, could be accomplished in just three days. This routing was archaeologically underpinned by the discovery of the names of some Second Dynasty kings engraved on stone vases found both in the temple, compound at the ports of Biblis in the Lebanon and at the ancient harbor city of Ugarit in modern Syria. The story, though, is based on a string of unwarranted assumptions. There is no evidence, for example, that before King Narmer a central authority of any kind was operating on the lower Nile let alone controlling a network of settlements in the South Levant with the aim of ensuring a supply of strategic materials to the inhabitants of the Nile Valley. Nor indeed is there evidence that boat builders of the time used imported wood. The oldest Nile boats that are known at present, the flotilla uncovered at Abydus and buried in the reins of Narmer's immediate successors, are entirely made of smaller native timber. By Narmer's day, as well. The mariners of the eastern Mediterranean already had long experience of sailing on those waters. Traces of a millennial coastal traffic, in particular, have been found off the Levantine littoral, where fishing boats occasionally bring up Levantine and Nilotic pottery even older than that of the Nakwadan's northern settlements. At Biblis, too, there is an ancient lighthouse with six mid Nakwadan anchors, large rectangles of limestone perforated to hold substantial cables, built into its walls. Nor what a cargo. Trade from a port like Budo need to have been conducted with substantial so-called Biblis boats. Recent voyages have shown that four men in a large canoe could have carried 200 weight of copper from Biblis to Budo in less than 20 days. So centuries before Pharaoh's Levantine settlements had disappeared, a variety of boats were already plying the Levantine seaboard and of course, the strong, high-shouldered so-called wine jars made by the Nakwaden. Potters are perfectly designed for stacking in the hulls of boats. There are, as well, more fundamental objections to such dreams of empire. Just as there is no evidence of the notion of a land of Egypt in King Narmer's time, no denominating hieroglyph, so too there is no trace of a modern sense of nationhood, let alone an incipient imperialism, in the relics of the period. So, at the island excavations at Aslan, modern ceramic specialists are no longer classifying the excavated wares of these early centuries as Egyptian or Nubian as if they were the separate products of two different cultures, but rather as the various components of a local island culture whose roots were spread between the north and south. Here, too, in excavations from Aslan to the Delta a new history is beginning to emerge, a history that, rather than recounting the rise and fall of Phantom Empires, is concerned in showing how the culture of the pharaohs was itself created, how its style and physical dimensions were first defined, and how at the same time the court employed an exclusive, narrow range of rare materials to identify and define its order and its offices that imported and exotic things, of course, had been prized by the people of the Lower Nile long before the pharaohs, since the time, indeed when the first farmers had gone to live beside the Fayum Lake, and many of these same materials appear in pharaonic regalia. Nakwa and cemeteries had held magpie.
collections of lapis lazuli and turquoise, obsidian and faience, along with tiny quantities of gold, silver and copper, traces of an international prehistoric traffic. In delight, many of these bright materials could also be obtained locally, of course. Washed out of their loads in antediluvian floods, nuggets of pure gold had been picked up from the dried-out beds of Egyptian wadi since prehistoric times. Carnelians and sard lie on the surface of some Egyptian deserts in night. Two had been used as beads since the times of the first farmers, along with chalcedony and jasper, floor spar and garnet, malachite, the leaf-green copper ore. That, along with smoky black galena, the Nakwadans had ground into dust to make. The pigments of their eye paints, is to be collected in the eastern deserts, while rock crystal and other rare and gleaming stones which had been used since earliest times can be found in a barren desert some 40 miles west of Abu. Sinbel. Afghan lapis had long since found its way down to the lower Nile along ancient Asian trade routes, together with the technique for making faience, the bright shining glaze that that had been used in jewelry since Badarian times. Ebony, too, had long been imported into the Nakata settlements from West Africa. In the early years of the 19th century, the Swiss explorer Jean-Louis Burkhardt had seen small logs of that same dark wood still being traded on the Nubian Nile, and though the Nile hippopotami had always been a source of sport and meat and ivory, the Nakwadans, as we have already seen, had imported live elephants, and quantities of tusks as well, from both Africa and Asia. There's little need to impoverish the motives of this ancient international traffic with discussions of market economics or the politics of prestige. Both the Badarians and the Nakwadans had possessed a hunter's eye and a sophisticated appreciation of fine craftsmanship. As their graves clearly show, they well appreciated the exact qualities of a diversity of both colors and materials from fur and fish skin, fine linens and turtle shell to creamy alabasters, soft shining, silver, black obsidian and jasper red, and lapis lazuli of such intensity that, still, today, in a world saturated with chemical color and illuminated screens, the blue stone engenders fascination when it is glimpsed in the darkness of an ancient tomb or, indeed, in the window of a Bond Street jeweler. It would be wrong, therefore, to assume that in the period of the first three, Dynasties, at the outset of pharaonic history, the procurement of such venerable. The lights had automatically endowed the early pharaohs with status and prestige. Rather, we should endeavor to discover how and why it was that, in the period of those first few dynasties, some of those exotic materials, gold, lapis and the rest, seemed to have been employed exclusively within the royal workshops and came to stand at the very center of pharaonic culture the material world. It is difficult today to locate with any great exactitude when and where the international prehistoric traffic in bright and pretty things had begun. Apart from lordly lapis lazuli, which appears to have been mined in just a few locations in northern Afghanistan, few of the exotic materials used by the Nakwadan craftsmen have been subjected to scientific tests to determine their origins, in such tests as have been made are not infrequently disputed. There are problems, too, of terminology. Is the jade that had been collected by the people of the Lower Nile since the earliest prehistoric times really jade at all, or its harder, heavier cousin, nephrite? The former would have been mined in Asia, the latter at various European sites. Had the obsidian found in the Mastaba and Nakata originated in Chad, in Ethiopia or Anatolia, or indeed from all of these, or from other sources yet unknown, were the ambers and resins that had been placed in Nakwadan and early dynastic graves gathered in Syria or Libya, or from the beaches of the Baltic? Nor are these simply problems of physical identification. There is, for example, an intrinsic difference between the odd nuggets of alluvial copper which were hammered into beads and needles by the Badarians and early Nakwadans, and the copper ingots that first appear in mid-Nakwadan times, when the great wooden boats had begun to ply the Nile and copper had become the primary raw material of ancient Egyptian tools, 
At that same time, from the middle of the fourth millennium increased amounts of lapis lazuli, obsidian, gold, and silver have also been found in contemporary graves, a funereal enrichment that spread with the Nakwaden cemeteries as settlements were established at Gerza, in Memphis, at Iwan and in the Delta. Recent surveys in the Egyptian deserts have shown that local sources of copper were hardly being exploited in mid nakwaden times, which suggests that its increased use in that period, along with the simultaneous rise in the amounts of gold and silver, lapis lazuli and obsidian, was another consequence of the increasing traffic on the trade routes down which copper ingots were being imported into the valley of the lower Nile. These routes, as we have already seen, seem to have extended right through the settlements of the South Levant to the metal workings of the Wadi Fianan in Jordan and similar sites much further north. These, then, are the established land routes that were broken in the mid-first dynasty when the Pharaonic settlements in the South Levant began to disappear. At exactly the same time, the considerable traces of copper tools being used in the court workshops, along with the large numbers of copper tools being buried. And the cemeteries of Memphis and Abydos show that, at the same time as these long-established trading networks were disappearing, supplies of copper, along with those of other rare materials, rather than diminishing had actually increased. It is likely, of course, just as the presence of fine alabaster vases made in the court workshops of the Second Dynasty and excavated in the Biblos temples, suggest that a continuing trade in materials such as copper was conducted by seagoing craft docking at Lebanese ports. These same routes, indeed, facilitated the smaller traffic in lapis lazuli and other alien materials. At exactly the same time, however, large numbers of small copper mines were established in the eastern deserts of Egypt, at sites strung out across the hills midway between the Red Sea and the Valley of the Nile a fact that makes it highly likely that the great copper mines of Sinai that would be so heavily exploited from the Third Dynasty onwards were also prospected and opened up at this time. Now too, halfway between this line of copper workings and the beaches of the Red Sea coast, a string of gold mines was established, using two-handed stone hammers, weighing between 15 and 20 pounds, their miners worked in trenches, some of them above ground, others, like the tomb makers of later times, following the rock faults which run down deep into the desert cliffs. Here, then, in the same territories where their ancestors had freely walked and picked up loose nuggets of metal, teams of professional miners now pounded at the load within the rock and washed its dust to reveal the yellow sparkling grains. This, of course, was also the period in which the fortress at Aswan with its colony of granite workshops had been established. This same period as well dash. The reigns of Jurangjet and Den, witness an explosion of the products of the quartz stone vase workshops as the traditional Nakwad and taste for fine designs. And exotic materials extended and enlarged to produce those myriad masterpieces of design and ingenuity whose tantalizing fragments of Milano and Petri excavated by the Tanatabitis. There were marvelous imitations of rush baskets and fig leaves cut from blocks of silt stone, hard stone vases worked. So finely that they obtained the luminosity of flowers, a range of beauteous alabaster forms, jars and dishes such as were found in distant Biblis, and fine. Round offering tables and elegant tiny pots for oils and cosmetics. At this same time too, marble, amethyst and feldspar, and other stones that were hardly used in Nakwaden times but which naturally occur in the desert. Mountains to the east of the valley of the lower Nile appear in ever-growing quantity in the royal graves. The famous bracelets of gold, amethyst and turquoise that Petrie found still wrapped around their owner's arm are among the first known examples. Alabaster, too, much of it mined in the great quarries of Hatnub, 140 sailing miles to the south of Memphis now became the commonest. Stone of Royal Stone Working Workshops Fair onic inscriptions of later periods record that expeditions to the Egyptian deserts organized to collect some of these same materials required hundreds of 
people to carry the water and supplies in such inhospitable environments. The early desert mines and quarries, therefore, represent a considerable investment. On the part of the early court and, as in the workshops in the island fortress at Aswan, it is unlikely that such projects could have been undertaken in the centuries before the kings and the resources of a centralized supply system became available. Not surprisingly, therefore, as the use of materials such as hard stone and copper seems to have been restricted to the court, so too from the times of the Mid-First Dynasty, other materials, such as silver and gold, obsidian, ebony and Afghan lapis that in earlier times had been used in burials all along the lower Nile are now only to be found in the royal tombs and, to a lesser degree, in the tombs of their courtiers and estate managers, as the court began to be engaged in the procurement of most of these materials, so their use became restricted. The ancient Nakwadan identity had been subsumed. The ageless skills that Nakwadan craftsmen had employed for a millennium had been taken over by Pharaoh and his court. The ethereal beauty of rare gems and precious metals. Goods that reflected the primary colors and ingredients of the Nile Valley. Landscape had become part of court identity. Before and after. With the retreat of the northern settlements, the cutting of Levantine traffic and the prospecting of the Egyptian deserts, changes may be detected in attitudes within the royal court towards other communities. It is as if the court had withdrawn into itself, cultures outside its orbit, with their different modes of dress, comportment and behavior, were increasingly shown as different, as foreign, and at exactly the same time, the exotic mixtures of articles that had long since filled the largest and most lavish Nubian burials with masses of late. Nakwadan wares, with fine furniture and Levantine pottery, came to an abrupt end. This, it has been suggested, was because the kings of the first dynasty had blocked the trade routes along which a wide variety of materials and goods from Central Africa and the Levant had previously been trafficked. At this same time, however, the Nubian a group culture, whose northern settlements had flourished. Alongside those of the Nakwadans for centuries, entirely disappear, not just its northernmost communities, between Hierakonpolis and Aswan, but the entire culture that had lived along the 300-mile stretch of riverbank between Hierakonpolis and the Nile's second cataract, south of Wadi Halfa and modern-day Sudan. Had those ancient herding communities simply died away, were they attacked, or had they traveled southwards with their herds? For whatever reason, there is scant evidence of anyone inhabiting Lower Nubia for several centuries after the coming of the pharaohs. Such emigrations, of course, were not exclusive to pharaohs' neighbors, the ancient communities of the Nakwadan heartlands, after all, had been moving northwards along the Lower Nile for centuries so that, by the time of the early dynasties, the region around Memphis had become the central focus of the newly created culture of the Pharaonic court, and it was there, whilst the other settlements along the Lower Nile had remained inside the broad material world of late Nakwadan culture, that, by the beginning of the Third Dynasty of Kings, the court workshops had already developed the essentials of that narrow and distinctive repertoire which they preserved throughout the following millennia. Here, then, was created that specific mix of raw materials and imagery, the style, and a distinctive visual order that would be applied to everything from the design of groups of hieroglyphs and the drawing of the human body to the forms of stone block architecture. A great part of this process of selection and reformation must therefore have taken place after the extensive changes which occurred in the court workshops of the mid-first dynasty. All that may be gleaned of the following phase, however, which must have taken place within the second dynasty and in the region of Memphis, is by a comparison of the products made in the periods before and after that dark tunnel. Clearly, the traditional methods of placing signs and ordered registers and the techniques of rays relief developed in late Nakwadan times were retained and refined so that they triumphantly re-emerge in the surviving products of the court workshops of the third dynasty. So, too, many of the hieroglyphs, 
patterns and devices introduced during the First Dynasty were retained and formalized. Yet at the same time, many long-used images were discarded. The two entwining monsters of King Narmer's palette, for example, were expunged from courtly repertoire, along with other alien exotica. Some of the survivals, though, were quite remarkable. The Sarik, for example, and those most ancient. Images of bulls' heads, the distinctive shapes of staffs and staves, furniture legs, made in the ancient shape of animals' limbs and a myriad other prehistoric forms, would be as widely used in the courtly arts of the Third Dynasty as they had been in previous millennia in the Neolithic farming communities of Europe, Africa and Asia.